Welcome to the Behind the Lecture, where we dive deep into the inside experiences and expertise of our esteemed faculty here at the University of Manchester. Join us as we uncover the stories behind the lectures and inspire and shape our learning community. Our special guest today is an English physicist and musician who is a professor of particle physics in the School of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Manchester. He is best known to the public as the presenter of science programs, especially BBC Radio 4's The Infinite Monkey Cage and The Wonders of Series. And for popular science books such as Why Does E Equals MC Squared and The Quantum Universe. It is indeed an honor and privilege to welcome Professor Brian Cox. Professor Brian, thank you once again for allowing us to have this interview. It's pleasure. absolute pleasure on our side. So I have a series of questions here I want to throw at you. The very first question I would like to ask is, what is your first impression of UAE? Oh, I, I love being here. I've been here several times before, but I, I hadn't been to Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. um, but I've been to Dubai and enjoyed it massively. So I'm enjoying my, my next city, my second city <laughs> in, in the UAE. Have you been to uh, Saudi Arabia as well? I've never been to Saudi. Mm -hmm. Is this something you're going to look forward to come as well? I, I lo you know, I love traveling and I've been very lucky that after a very slow start, I didn't leave the UK till I was 17, right? I hadn't been out of the... And then after that, because of the filming with the BBC and, and obviously being in academia and now the live shows that I do, I've been almost, <laughs> almost everywhere. <laughs> Antarctica, I'm missing the Antarctic. Oh, that's that's a big ambition of mine. Well, I look forward for that. <laughs> so I have this also question for you. Why did you join the University of Manchester delegation to the region? Uh, what do you hope to learn and communicate while you're here? Well, I'm here in part. I was invited to give a talk at a space debate in Abu Dhabi, which is interesting because, as you may know, the UAE is not only has a space program now, and in fact, one of the photographs, one of my favorite photographs of Mars ever taken is from the Hope spacecraft, wow. which is a, 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 the, the Emirates Mars mission. And so, so I, I was invited there. And, and the reason is that this region, UAE, is very focused not only on the technology and, and launching its own missions into space, but the global regulation of space. So uh, the, the, the challenge of that conference was how do we make sure that space remains accessible to all? How do we manage it? Because it's a global resource. I mean, so someone said at the conference, the laws of physics tell you that no one region or country can manage space because you're passing, <laughs> the, the bit of space we're trying to manage keeps moving, right? So, so it's, it's part of the value, actually, of thinking in this way is it, is it, ha it is a, opportunity that has to be managed globally and and this uae in particular is taking uh, uh, playing a big part in that role of, of the global the new global framework of space so that's one of the reasons i'm here second reason is that the university of manchester I, i've been at the university of manchester since 1992. Okay. Uh, i was an undergraduate postgraduate uh, postdoc lecturer <laughs> and now professor so i've never left and so, so as I've kind of got older and grown up, I've got more involved with the University of Manchester in, in, in all its guises. So, of course, not only in Manchester, but here. So I've meant to come here for, for a very long time. And so I finally got my, got my chance. That was an incredible journey, by the way. Student, a lecturer, uh, what, what a transition there. I mean... Well, I didn't... Well, you know, I, I love the university. It's... Um, you know, the moment I got there, because I've been a musician, so I, I went a little bit later. I, I went at the age of 23 as an undergraduate. And the moment I got there, you get a sense, because of the way the campus is, and it's a big university, uh, that you're... I felt I was wandering around through knowledge. <laughs> right, in every corner you turn, you know, you turn... If you ever go to Manchester, the main building is very beautiful. But just around the corner is where Rutherford discovered the atomic nucleus. So it's there. The, the building is still there. Or, of course, Alan Turing's work there in Manchester. Later, you walk past the Graphene Institute, where, where Andre Geim and Kostya Novoselov yeah. discovered this, this wonder material. So it's everywhere you look, there's history and innovation now. But it's the scale of it. To be a student there for me, uh, opened my eyes to a lot more than just physics because there's so much going on 
in, in a big university like that. If you have met the Middle East Center team, how important are these centers to the global university like Manchester? They're, they're hugely important because um, what, the, what I think the, the world needs, to be, not to be too grandiose about it, but we need to think as a planet. You see it in the space industry in particular. You see that this is, it, it's a little spacecraft. And, and the, the great Carl Sagan said that wherever we get to in the future, in, in a thousand years, 10,000 years time, people will look up for the, that pale blue dot in the sky and know that that is where every human in the universe came from. Right? So, so this, this idea that in, in the 21st century and indeed beyond, we, we have to start thinking globally, working together, managing global problems as a single planet. It is not optional. I think that's extremely important. So that means to me, academia has always been multinational. It's always been global. But the institutions, perhaps, not so much. They, so, so for me, the, the, the idea that institutions... That, uh, my vision, right, for Manchester, I suppose, in some sense, would be that it, it's Manchester only in name. But it's not a geographical... In the future, I would like it to be one of the global institutions that shares, generates new knowledge, shares knowledge. And, and I, I would hope that the, the geographical boundaries sort of fade away. That would be my utopian vision. And so this is, in a sense, a part of that, right? Because it's, it's, it's not like a piece of Manchester geographically in the UAE. It's Manchester University, I, I would like to say. Becoming one, that's what they say. That's the Manchester 2035 uh, vision. And of course, you know, the, the point is that what are we trying to do as universities ultimately? What have we always done for thousands of years? Universities have acquired knowledge about the world, about nature, about human society and so on. And, and that's their purpose. Their, their purpose is to do that. And so in order to do that successfully, you, you need to, you would like to access talent from all over the world. You, you would like to um, access or have different perspectives on the global challenges that we face. And so if you think about a, a great university like Manchester, if, it, if it's only operating and attracting talent in a small region in the northwest of England, right, albeit full of talent, I'm from, yeah. <laughs> I'm from the northwest of England, then it's, it, to me it's not, it's not, playing its role as a university. I suppose the, the university tells you, isn't it? University. Yeah. It's about the universal nature of knowledge. Wow. That's amazing. Um, next question. Uh, UAE is a visionary country mm. and uh, embraces digital and other innovation, attracting global talent, including entrepreneurs and educators. Do you see parallels between Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Manchester? Oh, definitely. There's a, there's a very famous essay that I love by one of the great physicists, Freeman Dyson, who um, uh, and he wrote an, an essay called Manchester and Athens, oh. where he said in the history of humanity, the, the, the two greatest cities, this was, I think he wrote it in the 1990s, perhaps, were, were, were Athens, <laughs> ancient Greece, you know, the classical world, and then Manchester, because it's the home of the Industrial Revolution. Yes. So now, when you look at the world, you see that there are the, the, the number of great influential cities and regions is, is proliferates, it's increasing. And that's <laughs> to the benefit of everybody. And so I agree with you. I can see that, um, that there's energy here. As, as I said, that the, I, I, just because I was involved in it a couple of days ago, the energy and the focus on space, the, the economy that exists above our heads, mm. which someone said, by the way, shouldn't be thought of as a separate economy. It's not space economy and earth economy, it's the economy. So, so that those, those, w w what I've been in, um, impressed by in the UAE is the focus on those global challenges. And where are the, where are the areas where, where a difference can be made and needs to be made? And as I said, what, one of them is the management of the, the resource above our heads. Thank you for that. Um, your lecture, at uh, Le Louvre, how do you pronounce it? 
Lou, uh, everybody's French, isn't <laughs> in French, I was, I pronounce it like you pronounce oh, it, French, Louvre, Louvre, the Louvre, it's probably Louvre, this is a good for French to American, yeah, English, yeah. So. let's say, but the Louvre, let's say, I would say, our future in space, why did you select this as a team, and what is our future in space? Well, it's kind of, it's, it's a title that you could take anywhere, because, um, we are in space, of course, so it could just be read as our future. Um, but I think it's one of the areas where many different technologies are coming together. And also you see the potential of... The, I, I went back to um, some of the, earlier, the earliest books that I'd read on these, on these questions. There's a great book by a Gerard O'Neill, a very famous book called The High Frontier in 1976. It was a long time ago in which he was asking the question, if we are freed from the constraints of finite resources on this, on the, in this tiny shell sort of circling our planet, the surface of the planet, then what might we become? Okay. So it feeds into all the things that you think of that universities do, acquiring knowledge about nature. If we can acquire this knowledge, if we can learn more about the world, we can develop greater capabilities in, in all areas, what can we become? And so really the lecture could have been called What Can We Become? But it's a very nice, for me, it's a very exciting area, which is also entertaining. You know, we're talking about the study of black holes, which are at the University of Manchester, actually, one of my, my PhD students is working on black holes, but in the context of quantum information, which feeds into quantum computing, all these new technologies. So it's in, in some ways, the lecture is about the unity of knowledge. It's, it's, it's about the fact that by studying the things up there, um, we're not just learning about stuff up there. We're learning about nature and the way nature works as a whole. I hope I, I, hope I have another hour for this topic yeah, because it's very yeah. interesting. I love this topic, but we have a sort of time. Another question, uh, Professor Brian. Do you have a comment on the ambitious UAE space program, which includes lunar, Mars, and asteroid belt missions? I, I really, really mm -hmm. do. I think this is one of the most exciting areas that the UAE is heavily involved in. Um, we, you mentioned Mars. So Mars is interesting from multiple perspectives. Uh, one perspective, of course, is it's the only other planet in the solar system that we could ever envisage living on. <laughs> if you think Mercury is too hot, Venus is absolutely too hot and horrendous, and everything else is made of gas, right? So, there's a, so it's, the, it's the only place in the foreseeable future. It's also one of the most exciting places to search for life beyond Earth. But more than that, and this links into the asteroids, it's about resources. So, as we all know, the resources of Earth are finite and under pressure. Whereas, you go to the asteroids, and Mars really is on the inner edge of the asteroid belt. So we're going to go out into the asteroids. Mars, I think, is the staging post. Then, you have effectively unlimited resources. And some of them, lithium, for example, are very important in, 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 de in, in developing the green future, uh, batteries and so on. We, those resources are going to become more and more scarce on Earth, which puts more pressure on the environment. It puts geopolitical pressure on us all because we start competing for resources. And we don't need to because they're all there in the asteroid belt. So I think that the focus on the, the beginnings of those steps outwards um, really, we're talking about industrializing space, or, or you might say extending the economy outwards, first to the moon, and then to Mars, and then into the asteroids. It's not really optional. And so I think it's an extremely smart move to focus on that infrastructure and those problems. And the problems are not only technical, uh, and they're not, they're not only infrastructure problems, they're legal problems, they're framework problems. It's developing the, the, the frameworks within which we go and search for those resources as a planet and so on. So yeah, I, I, I'm very excited about that. And as you mentioned, um, it's not just words. I mean, the, 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 the Emirates Mars mission yeah. is tremendously successful. Uh, and and it's, it's sending back a lot of data about the whole of Mars. So it's a unique um, additional look at that vitally important planet that's being provided by that mission. Does that mean we're going to see you often here in UAE because of this development? Oh yeah, I might not, I might not actually go home. <laughs> I'm considering 
uh, <laughs> changing my flight. <laughs> All right, I just have a couple more questions, Professor. We have around 5,500 Manchester current students and alumni in the region, all working professionals on, on the part-time master's program. What do you think of the university's reach in the region, um, ability to make an impact and difference through this community? Uh, well, I've seen it. I, I met some alumni earlier, actually, and you see the, uh, the impact. And the impact goes both ways, by the way. As I mentioned earlier, um, it's not just it's not just people coming to an offshoot of the University of Manchester to be educated by this you know, institution that's been doing this for 200 years and is very, very good at it. It's, it's the two-way flow of talent and information and knowledge that I think is, is most exciting. So I think the impact goes both ways. One last question, Professor Brian, before I let you go. How important is the Middle East to the University of Manchester as a source of education, research, innovation, and other potential partnership or opportunities? Oh, it's, it's vitally important. Um, I, I think that, as I said before, I think that um, our educational institutions, they are universities in the purest sense. Um, they should be, which means that they, they're, they're a global resource. And so uh, when you talk about regions like this, which are, which are growing, which are innovating, which are full of talent and full of excitement, actually, visionary regions, then the idea that the, these, these institutions can, can play a role in that, be part of it, and be kind of, in a sense, uh, re-energized re you know, by the, the, this two-way exchange of ideas, is to me, it's vitally, it's fundamentally important, actually, I would say, to the institution itself. It's really a pleasure and honor to see you today, Professor Brian Cox, and I hope to see you soon in Dubai. An absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>